So the next voice that you hear after the video will be that of Pastor Carlton Matthews. Amen. So this is the morning of course corrections because since I'm up here and this is my message, there is no video. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's okay. That is, it is a very cool picture. I really like that guy walking down the train tracks. I'm a little nervous for him though because he is walking down the train tracks. Uh, I would say a parental discretion because you, your children should not do that. <laughs> Make sure that your children are not working down the lonely road. Yeah, don't try this at home. There we go. Not parental discretion. All right, so let's pray, and then we will go to work. I am very hot this morning in this microphone, so I know we're going to get that worked out. So let's pray. Father, I'm excited this morning because of everything that you are doing. Uh, even though you have taken us through a road that we don't always anticipate, specifically for me, you are bringing ups and you're bringing downs, and I'm excited because I know that even in those ups and downs, you are there, and you're doing something amazing. So as my soul sometimes leaps with joy and sometimes is downcast, I am excited because I remember you and know you, and you most of all know me. So as we go into this, let your words come forward. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I really wrestled with this. Pastor Paul uh, threw me a curveball. He knows that I like to know I'm going to preach uh, like kind of at the close to the last minute because whenever I get to preach, if someone says, hey, I want you to come and speak, I am very nervous because that means that whatever I'm going to speak on, God is going to deal with me in that area as I get close. So Pastor Paul gave me uh, almost a month to uh, kind of get my head wrapped around uh, coming in and preaching for you guys today. So that means that God has been really dealing with me. But that's okay. And I want you to understand that. It's okay for God to deal with you. There are times and things that you're going to go through, and it is okay. So as I went back and forth over what I was going to talk about, and I tried to I had a, a couple of different ideas, and God kind of led me to a couple different places. I had a, a very technical sermon. I shared with the small group on Thursday a little bit of what I was going to speak on, and uh, God began to deal with me there and said, you know, I'm not sure if that's really where we need to go today to really dive into uh, some really technical theological stuff, because as much as it joy and brings happiness to my soul, Sometimes on a Sunday morning, we need to kind of remember God. And so he led me back to the Psalms. And he led me back to some Psalms that I had enjoyed uh, early on in, in my walk as I was learning and studying and, and, and being taught and trained in the ministry. Uh, so today we're going to be in Psalm 42. And we're going to look at Psalm 42 and 43 because since I'm a teacher by trade and, and, and by history, I have to tell you something. So in the book of Psalms, verse, uh, chapter 42 and 43, in some of the old Jewish manuscripts are actually combined. So they're one Psalm, not two. But in most Bibles, I know specifically in the NIV, it's two, it's two actual chapters there. And it's right at the beginning of a separation point in the Psalms. So the Psalms can be looked at as being broken up into five books. Those five books generally looked at as being lined up with the original five books of the Old Testament. So as we're moving into book two, that means we're moving into the Exodus set of Psalms. And these are the first two in that Exodus set of Psalms. And at the very beginning, if you're looking, and I'm going to read this part because I didn't have it on my slide, um, it says, for the director of music, a miskel of the sons of Korah. Now, a miskel is a song of learning. So that means we're going to learn something as we go through the song. And the, the good thing about the Psalms, if you haven't had time to get into them, is the Psalms are songs. So that they were set to music. That meant that people sang these things. They walked around and they talked and they, it was like poetry set to music. It's beautiful imagery. And just like us, the Psalms from Psalm 1 all the way to Psalm 150 is full of emotion. So everybody who's ever listened to music, and I'm sure everyone in here has at least listened to one song in their life, there's always some emotion that's there. But the beauty of the Psalms is that it goes through all emotion. Uh, 
feelings of great joy and passion and excitement for what God is doing and for life in general and also moments of just, oh, Lord, why? Why, Lord, why? If you've ever had that moment, it's in the Psalms. Some, some uh, commentators have mentioned about the Psalms, and it says that the Gospels, our four books of the Gospels, show and tell you Jesus' life. And they give you the things that happen. But the Psalms tell you what the heart of it is. That Jesus dealt with, and we always say that Jesus lived through, and he was tempted in all ways, and all things came at him even though he lived a sinless life. If you want to know what that is, read the Psalms. That moment of being downcast in the Garden of Gethsemane, that moment of triumph on the Mount of Transfiguration, all of those things you can feel in the Psalms. So as we get into that, remember that moment, because the Bible is not just a text, a textbook for you to memorize some facts and then go forward. The Bible is a book talking to you and telling you about God. Remember that it is talking and pointing at all times back to the Lord of the universe, the one who loves you, the one who saves your soul, the one who has provided the day and the night, the stars and the moon, all of it the wonderful clothes you wear, those soft seats you're sitting in, this building, the funds in your bank account, the lack of funds in your bank account. He is the one that has done it all. And he gave you something to remember him and to see him. So for the director of music, a miscal of the sons of Korah. Oh, and just one more thing about Korah. So remember I said this was the Exodus the beginning of the Exodus book. So in the book, in, as the, the, the children of Egypt, or children of Egypt, the children of Israel are moving and they're leaving, an interesting thing happens. A person named Korah actually led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron during their time in, in the wilderness. And what happened is that everyone who was in rebellion against God, remember, the rebellion is against God. When you go against, against his people, the rebellion is always against God. But in this case, they were going against Moses and Aaron, and God wiped out everyone in the rebellion. Everyone. But there's a note there in Numbers, in Numbers 26, uh, verse 11, where it says, but the line of Korah did not die out. So it's apt that the very first psalm in the Exodus set of psalms is from his line, the sons of Korah. It says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the, mighty, uh, the, the protection of the mighty one <laughs> with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizra. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to, my, to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning? oppressed by the enemy. My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My Savior and my God, why is your soul downcast? And that's where God dealt with me over the last few weeks as I got closer and closer to this time. God has led me along some very interesting paths over the last month. You guys know I was not here last week, and I was attending a wedding. So that's a time of incredible joy. My goddaughter got married uh, to a, a, a nice young man down in Houston, Texas, where it was super hot, times of dejection. 
106 degrees while driving with the windows down and hot air blowing inside the car. It's not good. I do too, Miss Connie, I promise. It was just it was a bit of a shock for me with all of the rain and everything that we've had here. But God was dealing with me as we were doing that. We had some things that happened family-wise and some things that have been going on in my extended family, in my family in Texas, in the church that we have in Texas. And God has been working with all of us in this church. So I know that everybody here has had some things going on in their own worlds. So it's not just about what I'm dealing with. It's also about what you're dealing with. But the very beginning of this psalm is your focus. As the deer pants after water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go to meet God? Where can I go? Do you chase him? Do you seek after him? When things are great and everything is going well and life is wonderful, do you chase after God? When you get a new business deal, when your, your grades are where you want them to be, where the teacher says no quiz, when you thought there was going to be a quiz, where your spouse and, and, and you and your spouse are connecting one to the other, when things are going well, do you chase God? Are you like, God, I know that these good things that I have are because of you, so I need more of you because that is the reason why my life looks this way. On the other side, when things are not so well, do you pant after him? When you get that bad grade, when you and your spouse don't see eye to eye, when the deal falls through, when your children aren't listening, when your phone breaks, I mean, we're all over the place, right? Do you still chase after God? Do you still say, God, I need you. I love you, God. You are mine and I am yours. How can I seek after you? Where can I meet you, God? I need you most of all. My life looks like this because of you. Because whether it rains or it shines, God is the same. He hasn't changed. He's not different. So in good times and in bad Trust him, love him, chase him, seek after God. Do you see God as all you need? And that's difficult. That's difficult for me. I'm a doer. I like to do things. There are some things that I don't like to do, but I have learned to do more things than I thought I would ever be capable of doing. And so when something arises in my life, I want to go and take care of it. But sometimes it's not about getting that thing done. Sometimes it's about seeing what is actually going on, actually seeing what's going on around you and noticing that God is there and he's doing something in your life. Because sometimes the bad times are you know, you can honestly pinpoint like, yes, I know because I made that left turn. That's the reason why I'm going down a one way street and I'm now getting a ticket. See, I guess that has never happened to any of you great drivers. That has happened to me, especially when I drive in D.C. That has happened. OK. And I know that it was my fault because I turned and I should have been looking. But sometimes things go wrong. And I don't know why I have planned. I've prepared, I planted seed, I invested, I did this, I did that, I followed all the self-help books, all the stuff that people told me was this was going to generate success for you, and it not happen. But it wasn't until I began to seek after God that I understood that sometimes we go through those things. The rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. But is he enough? Is he enough? Is he everything that you need? That was one of the questions that we talked about uh, while I was in Texas talking with some friends, talking with a really good friend, actually. And I said, if your situation doesn't change, is God enough? And that was what I left him with, too. And I'll leave you with that, too, and not say anything else about it. So verse 3 says, my tears have been my food day and night. 
And while people say to me all day long, where is your God? Where is your God? Have you ever heard someone say that to you? If this is happening to you, where is your God? You say your God is a healer. Why aren't you healed? You say, you're, you say your God is a provider. Why do you have lack? Have you ever asked yourself those questions? In that dark night of the soul, in that moment where it feels like everything is pressing in on you, have you asked, where is my God? Where is he? But verse 4 says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. And that's really the answer for you. When you're going through those times of great heights and great lows, you need to remember God. You need to remember who you are pouring your soul out to. The reason why we go through things is to point us back to God. Everything that we go through, the struggles that we have, when we sin, he says, fall to your knees and repent. That is supposed to drive you back to the cross. God knows you're going to sin. He sent Christ to die for you and all of your sins from now and from then until then. So if that's the case, repent and cry out to God. Seek after him in your mistakes. Seek after him in those dark nights of the soul when things seem oppressive. Reach out to him in those moments of great triumph. Reach out to him. It is all about God. God's love covers everything. Remember him. Remember those moments. It says, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng." Excited to be in church, excited to worship God, excited to be among God's people, excited to be amongst people who call your father. You have the same father. You're the same family. Whether you're here at Living Hope Church or you're at Houston Christian Fellowship or you're at St. Mark's or you're at Payne or any other church in this area, no matter what, you should delight in being around other people. That was my excitement that I heard from Women of Faith yesterday when my wife said, most of the people there I didn't know. That's exciting when we want to go and worship with other people. These four walls will not get it. And I love these four walls. I love these four walls. I love these smiling faces. But you will not be enough. And I shouldn't be enough for you. Neither should Pastor Paul. You should be seeking other believers to be around and enjoy. You might have a home church, and you should have a home church. If you don't have a home church, I recommend this one. But here's the deal. You need to be among other believers, and you need to rejoice in the protection of the Almighty One. Because in those moments where, here we are in verse 5, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. On a practical level, being a part of a local church is all about being able to meet each other's needs. That's why we're here. If you have a need, you're supposed to tell your family. I know we don't all have the same types of family relationships and all families are different, but this family should be about God's work. So where there is lack, we should be able to meet the need. And where there's a need, we should meet it. And then outside of that, where there are needs elsewhere, we should meet those too. And we should be able to come together with other churches and meet the needs in our area, in our community. And we should take care of each other. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep and the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. Has has God swept over you? Have you felt him washing over you? Have you had that moment where you couldn't stand it because God was so heavy on you that you couldn't 
You, you just didn't even want to move. You just wanted to just sit or you wanted to lay down or you wanted to stand up, but you just knew that something was going on because God washes over his children and he takes care of his children and he's there to bring you through those moments when your soul is downcast. He brings you through those moments where you're at the heights, when you could slip into arrogance and say, this is the reason why, because of what I did, and I have achieved this. But God washes over you and changes you on the inside because his breakers wash over you. If that is not your experience, that's why you have family to pray with, to work with, to talk with. Because it is in those moments where you are working things out one to the other and studying God's word and learning about him that he begins to reveal more of himself. If you find yourself perpetually by yourself, you should make some changes. Small groups, make a friend, attend an event, prayer night, make more friends, send an email, make a phone call, make more friends. You've got a family here of people that you don't know. I have people here that I don't know as well as I would like. Take the time to get to know each other because that is what God is doing and that is what this is for. Again, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. I will yet praise him, my soul and my God. Remember God. Remember him. Remember what he has done. Remember what he has brought you through. Remember your history. So in the midst of all of the things that I was going through and the struggles that I had even before we left to go to Texas, I was having this moment where I was running at that 100 mile. You guys know that, right, where you're just like running, running, running. You're not even sure if you're really getting anything done, but you're doing a lot of stuff. (laughs) And we were about to leave, and we were going to leave for a week. And so, you know, work and and, and family, trying to get everything, figure out stuff with the, the new dog we have at home, like all this stuff, trying to just get everything done. And I happened to stop. Um, was, oh, I had to go to Sam's and get stuff because, you know, I'm the courier for my family. So I I go to Sam's and I buy all the things and I have to go deliver all this stuff because we're going to be gone. That means that people aren't going to have their, in this case, their Pepsis. And that's a very important thing. Even though I'm a Coke guy, I still have to go buy all the Pepsis for people. And so in the midst of all of that running and doing and doing and doing, I drove over to my grandmother's house. And I dropped off, I was dropping off the Pepsis. Normally I just like, hey, here, boom, I'm gone, on to the next thing. But something was different that morning. I don't know what it was, but when I went in and I put it down, I was like, hey, hi, Grandma. And I just talked to her for a few minutes. And I noticed that the house was in a bit of a disarray. So I looked, I was like, what's going on? Why is everything like piled up over here? And she's like, oh, I'm painting. And my grandma, she just paint whenever she feels like it, just move everything and get the rollers out and paint the ceiling, the walls. And that's fine. And, and we'll show up and everything will be weird. And then we'll come back like a couple hours later and everything will be back where it was. And if you ask her to help, she'll say, no, I got it. So I didn't say anything. She's like, oh, I'm painting. And so I go in the room. I said, oh, let me look. And I look and I notice that she's got most of it painted. There's a little um, thing a little section of wall that's not done. I'm like, hey, can you reach that? She's like, oh, I got it. Don't worry. And then I happen to look down on one of the couches, and I see uh, it's like a big piece of, like, white, like, poster board. Not poster board, the the hard back, like the backing. And I'm like, what is that, like, big, long piece? It's like this long. And it's just sitting on the couch. I'm like, what is that? And she's like, oh, yeah, I found this thing behind behind my couch. So I grab it, and I turn it around. And can you pull up the picture. So (laughs) this was hiding behind my grandmother's couch. So this is a picture from St. Mark's United Methodist Church, which is uh, the, the family, the, the family church. And this is only a piece of it. I don't think that's actually the whole thing. It goes a little bit further this way. And 
Um, so she has this thing, and it's on the, 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 the poster board, and around it are names where they were, like, writing names on it. Like, you know, this is this person, this is that person. And so I said, Grandma, I said, where did this come from? She's like, oh, yeah, um, her, my aunt, Aunt Irene, her sister, who had passed away a few years back, was working on the family history. And so she was, she and my grandmother and her sister Patricia were, Aunt Patricia were all, you know, kind of going through, trying to piece together who all these people are. And so they've got like, I don't know, 85, 90% of the names on this thing, right? So I say, well, Grandma, I don't, I, how old is this picture? And she says, well, I don't know. We're trying to figure that out. And she says, you know, we think that it's from the early 1900s. And I said, well, why do you think that? And she said, I don't know if you can tell, but right in the middle, there's a baby being held like in the top row. And so they know who that baby is. And so my, my homework assignment is to go over to the family cemetery where that baby is laid to rest and find out what year the baby was born because then that would mean that this is about a year or so in that area. But we're pretty sure that this is an early 1900s photo, church photo of all things. This is like the church directory like photo for St. Mark's from back there. And so we were kind of talking about the people in the picture, and Grandma was giving me a little bit about the history, and, and, you know, and, and I know a ton about St. Mark's. I won't get into their, their history, but one thing that she did point out is in there, uh, kind of right, it's kind of hard to say. He's like in the second row. All the way across, you see the kids, and then there's like an adult. That is William Matthews, <laughs> who was the pastor of St. Mark's back during that time. And he had that, and I knew that from seeing the photo because they used to keep pictures of all the old pastors at St. Mark's, and I remember him. Uh, and so that's one of, my, one of my relatives, my distant ancestors, and he was a pastor, and he was a pastor at St. Mark's. Uh, and then my, uh, m- my grandmother's uncle is up in the top row, uh, and she's still, my grandmother's still mad because her dad is not in that picture. Uh, and she's, she was really irritated. She's like, I don't know why dad wasn't in that picture. But as we were talking, I realized something very important, that we run and 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 we run. And And that causes us to be overwhelmed, okay? Now, I'm not a runner, so for those of you who run, you know that there's a moment when you're running where you're just like, I don't want to run anymore. And it happens. And you get overwhelmed and things start to catch up with you and you start to get Oh, you know, why, why, oh, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? And it's at those moments where you have to remember. And so that's what I leave you with this morning. The real main point of today's sermon is when your soul is downcast, remember. Remember God. Remember what he has done in your life. Remember the history of how you got to where you are. You may not know your family history to the extent that, you know, you can find a, you know, 100-year-old photo and, uh, and, you, and, and, and see the, 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 the lines of your family. But that doesn't change the fact that God has done something during your years on this earth. And that doesn't change the fact that there was someone before you who was thinking about you and was praying for you. There are people here in this church who pray every week for you and your soul and your life and your work and your home. Some people prayed you here. I'm one of them. I can tell you that I was prayed here. When my wife and I were struggling on whether to move back from Texas to Maryland and we were traveling down from from Philadelphia and we were in the car and we pulled over to pray and we said, okay, God, is this the time for us to move back? And that peace came over us and we knew that it was now time to leave five years of working in church life and living and, and raising a family and starting a family and getting married and it was time to move back home here But I didn't know that my prayer and our prayer on the side of the road coincided with someone else's prayer here. And even though it didn't happen immediately, sometime after that, I walked through the door and someone hugged me and said, I prayed for you. 
and here, here my family is. And that happens in your life. There are people, saints, who prayed for each and every one of you who said, I know at some point their soul will be downcast. God, please remind them of what you are doing. Even in their frustration, remind them that you're there. Remember God. Remember him. Remember the miracles that you've seen in your own life. Remember the life that you led before he saved you. Remember the down times where he came and he comforted you. When you lost someone close, when someone betrayed you, remember those times. Don't gloss them over and forget about them because there was a reason even for that. There was a reason even for that. Put your hope in God. He is your Savior, and he's your God. Amen? (laughs) Let's pray. God, I'm excited for all that you are doing. And most of all, God, I ask that you would be there with my family. That you would love them, you would keep them close, you would wrap your arms around them. Because, God, they need you. They need you more than anything else. It's not about us, but it is about us. Remind us how much we need you, and then give us work to go and reach out and love on our family. Because this place here you have called living hope. It is the living hope, the hope that never dies, the hope that came, the hope that went to the cross, the hope that rose again. So we don't have to be concerned with stress and anxiety because you are the living hope. You're a hope that never dies. You're a hope that's always there. Even when we struggle, you are the living hope. You are the hope that never dies. You are the hope that's always there. You are the one who loves our souls. You are the one who said, I will be patient so that none would perish. You are the one who said, continue to seek after me. Do this in remembrance of me. Meditate on these words day and night. So even when our souls are downcast, we remember you today, God. We remember you. In Jesus' name, amen.